Well, we should be fairly brief. I mean, you told us at the last time we were here to go see the Conservation Commission, see what they said about the gravels issue on the, the big potholes in there. We've met with their committee, and they said, you know, after discussion that they really have no no problems with, you know, putting gravel in the big potholes. I mean, if you wanted to do like a half a mile stretch of changing the road levels, then they would have, but, you know, just to add gravel to the potholes, they have no, no qualms about that, and, you know, if the city can do it, there's not a problem with them. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I actually spoke with you and Nissan of the Chapter 90 office at um, SDOT. Um, they would approve to allow us to purchase materials for the road reconstruction work in the meadows, uh, but the uh, issue is that we can't go over the existing grade lines that exist down there. Right. So it looks like uh, we'll be able to do some more uh, repairs using Chapter 90 funds because we don't have it in our general budget to buy that kind of amount of materials. To chapter nine. All right. And th thank you for the road graders been yeah. down there. So thank you very much for that's that's been a big improvement. Yeah. <clears throat> Mike. Do we have an estimate of how much? I don't know. I think so. We don't know. There's some pretty big uh, monster potholes down there. <laughs> the worst ones down uh, that I can recall is down by the uh, in uh, down by the. Uh, at the old ferry road that goes straight underneath Route 91 by the airport. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a bad one down there. Oh, I'm yeah. Yeah. That really needs attention for sure. Yeah. Um, I recall when we first talking about this, there was some uh, concern that some of the roads down, down there are not. Did that out? Um, I've done my research on it, and I've come up with what I can find as being public ways or uh, public ways accepted by the city. I've even gone through the county commissioner's file. We're going back to the late 1700s, and no roads were established in the meadows back then. So um, I'm a loss at all the farm roads and what they mean, but they, um, some people think they're public. I, I think they're actually private I, from what I've been able to find. So Old Ferry Road, Fair Street, uh, Hockman Road, Nook Road are probably the biggest ones that are public ways. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of it are just like I call them farm roads. And so the work that we're doing is on the public roads? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think it's the most concerned with the main roads where mm -hmm. all the equipment has to go through. The you know the auxiliary roads, you know, I people could deal with that, but the public seems to use a lot of those roads abusively. So basically we do a loop around the airport and then um, we'll do uh Hockman Road and parts of Milk Road. Um, what about Fair Street Extension? Uh, is there anything that you know on that note? We maintain it to the last house, okay. and that's it. I don't think we ever came in here with the intent of asking the board to consider all the roads down there, never from day one. I think it was always just trying to maintain the ones that were just given uh, the main access in there and, uh, you know, taken care of mm -hmm. all. I just wanted to make a comment. The reason I asked the question is because we're going through a process with some of our private ways here right. in town, and just in fairness to everyone, we should be spending our Chapter 90 money on our our roads. Yep. Where's the best place to get gravel? Well, anywhere. Well, I mean, you've got a what local gravel work? company in Bill Willard, and then it's right in town. <coughs> I don't know if Ned has any other ideas. We'd have to go to the public procurement for it. Yeah. Would we would take bids? Yes. Is it is it too early to talk about timelines? Yes. Okay. Well, one question that I might ask, uh, and is there any chance that we could have some hope that come fall when the guys are harvesting that you might have some time to come down over the over the That is the current plan. We do it twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. What we don't know is, uh, from your input, what is the best time in the fall to do it because crops come in and out of rotation all throughout the summer and into the fall. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I know that. Yeah. It's a late, late August at the early, <coughs> earliest, and then by middle of September, end of September at the latest, okay. it's somewhere in there. The potatoes start early, and then some of the rest of the stuff comes in a little bit later. Any more on the meadows? 
I would just ask, do you, do you feel that we're moving forward in a positive positive way? Are these, these, Absolutely. Are these oh, yeah, sure. yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, I mean, we'd like to thank you guys very much <laughs> for being down in there because we see the results. Everybody's, Absolutely. You know, we, we, to see things happen is, is what, it, what it's all about. We've got guys calling us and saying, you know, you're the Ag Commission. Uh, we, we need to have your help on this. And uh, that's why we come before you people and also the Conservation Commission try to get answers and expedite things and move things along. So if we can be of any help, we're glad to do as well. Maybe more? Um, I neglected to ask who you're filming for. North Street Neighborhood Association. Okay. Thank you. And um, are, are you um, Deborah Toledo? No, I'm Elizabeth Smith. Betsy okay. Smith. So, um, can I have a motion to take item number three out of order? I'd like to make a motion to take item number three out of order. Second. Okay. So, the third item is Dennis Carruth and Fred Pelka, uh, Spring Grove Cemetery. Do you want to talk about something? Thank you, like this? Thank okay. you much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, there's been some correspondence between city councilors, uh, myself, uh, board members, <coughs> activities at Spring Grove Cemetery, and um, being elevated to a nuisance level at this point. I've talked to Rich Parsoletti, who ran Parks and Cemetery for 20 years before becoming highway superintendent. I spoke with Bill Sullivan, who's the current foreman at the Parks and Cemetery. Uh, they claim that they're, they're, the only change that's happened in that amount of time really is according to them, is the, uh, we put the pole barn up there because the uh, shelter was taking over the facility on Prospect Street. And so we had to find a new home for the Parks Division. Mm -hmm. So there's three full-time employees up there, and then of course we have our seasonal staff that comes on and out of there. We have uh, 10 seasonals. Uh, some are shared in streets, some are in parks and cemeteries, so I would say there's probably five to six seasonals up there during the summer only. Mm -hmm. Uh, my understanding is that uh, they've had conversations with the neighbors about mm -hmm. moving operations around so they're not there at 7 o'clock in the morning with their lawn mowers or weed whack, whatever they're doing that day, but they try to get over that neighborhood about uh, at the latest by 9-ish, so that there's some quiet morning hours is my understanding. Um, uh, reading the letter, I did some research on all the blowers and mowers that we have up there. They all met. EPA or California emission certifications when we bought them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not the newest equipment, but they're in the, you know, the 10 to 12 year old period, so they're somewhat modern, I mm -hmm. guess I would say. And um, like I said, according to Rich and, and uh, uh, Bill, that not much has changed up there in 20 or so years. Uh, just quickly to the board, did everybody have a chance to read the letter? It was from uh, actually two weeks ago, I think, was sent out with the packet then. And uh, so I think I'll just go right to um, Denise and Fred, whichever one of you is going to speak, sure. um, to explain what you have written. Well, thank you uh, for placing this on the agenda for today's meeting. And thank you also, uh, Director Huntley, for providing us with some clarification and uh, answers in your letter of April 4th. And we agree with your suggestion that moving the city of Northampton towards becoming a more environmentally responsible municipality should be a citywide discussion that encompasses all the city departments and not just the DPW. And so we're going to contact the mayor's office and the city's sustainability officer, with whom we've already communicated, for their thoughts on how best to proceed with this. But in the meantime, we believe that the DPW can take a leading role in moving the city towards greater sustainability and environmental responsibility. And as you know, Monday was Earth Day and Friday is Arbor Day. For both these occasions, our mayor and the city council issued proclamations and resolutions emphasizing the importance of respecting our environment. Northampton has been held up and holds itself up as an example of a green community striving for sustainability and a decreased carbon footprint. Recently, both the Boston Globe and the Daily Hampshire Gazette have noted the city's environmental awareness, its consciousness of the crisis of climate change, and its encouragement to private citizens and businesses to do more to decrease our carbon footprint and foster sustainability. 
It is clear that Northampton is represented by a city government is willing to talk the talk, and we are here to encourage you today to do even more to walk the walk. Specifically, we want to draw your attention to the department's management of the Spring Grove Cemetery. Our property directly abuts the cemetery, and we both work at home. We are focusing on Spring Grove because we have a day-to-day -day knowledge of the activities there. Our observations as abutters for the past 19 years are that maintenance activities at Spring Grove have increased significantly. The erection of the pole barn and then, little by little over the following years, the storage of more equipment there seem related to the increase in activity. Staff at the cemetery have explained to us that in recent years there has been a change from doing maintenance work on an as-needed basis. Instead, the cemetery has been divided into five sections, and a more or less rigorous work schedule has been adopted. And so, last summer, despite the drought, when the grass in our yard didn't need mowing for weeks, the schedule was followed, and the cemetery was mowed nearly every working day, and occasionally on weekends as well. Furthermore, in the past, large portions of the cemetery not yet in use were left fallow. They were home to lupin and other wildflowers, birds, and animals. Now these, too, are cut repeatedly on schedule. And so we are here to ask several questions and to propose what we think are some relatively simple solutions. How does all this activity comport with the cemetery's primary purpose as a peaceful resting place for those we love who have died and a place where their loved ones can come, meditate, and visit? We have lived by the cemetery for 19 years. When we first arrived in 1994, in the spring, noise was the exception rather than the rule. Now, all too often, it is the rule rather than the exception. How does this comport with the city's commitment to sustainability? Is this the best use of increasingly limited municipal resources? We were gratified to learn in Mr. Huntley's email that the equipment purchased by the city conforms to California emission standards, which presumably means that the city's riding mowers, leaf blowers, weed whackers, dethatchers, and such are less polluting than similar machinery that doesn't meet these standards. It should be noted, however, that regardless of the standards, at least 20 California municipalities and various cities and towns all across the country, including Arlington, Brookline, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, have banned or greatly restricted the use of all leaf blowers, to cite just one type of lawn equipment, as simply being too destructive to the environment and too obtrusive in terms of noise. It should also be noted that many of these communities, including Cambridge, ban all leaf blower use during the summer months, and during the spring and autumn only permit devices with a rating of 65 decibels or less. Regarding the California standards, the good folks at Edmonds did exhaustive tests comparing leaf blowers with two-stroke and four-stroke engines to a 2012 Fiat 500 and the 2011 Ford F-150 Raptor pickup. Quoting their results, and I quote, the two-stroke leaf blower generated 23 times the carbon monoxide and nearly 300 times more non-methane hydrocarbons than the crew cab pickup. Let's put that in perspective. To equal the hydrocarbon emissions of about half an hour of yard work with this two-stroke leaf blower, you'd have to drive a Raptor for 3,887 miles, or the distance between uh, northern Texas and Anchorage, Alaska, end quote. It stands to reason that the less this equipment is used overall, the less carbon and pollutants it will generate. In addition to carbon and air pollution, the increased use of this equipment from spring to early winter has radically changed the ambiance and quality of life in our neighborhood, certainly from the hours of 7 a.m. to after 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. Our small neighborhood, comprising Burncolt Road, Beano Terrace, Sterling Road, Hastings Heights, and Spring Grove Avenue, has been changed from a relatively quiet, even sleepy cul-de-sac into a soundscape that at times seems more appropriate for an area, an area zone for commercial or industrial use. In the autumn, for instance, on numerous occasions from mid-September to late November, several workmen with leaf blowers will move up and down the tombstone, while a large flatbed truck with a vacuum hose moves slowly down each road, sucking up the accumulated leaves. This seems particularly wasteful in petroleum and work hours. The leaves that color and fall from New England's trees have long been celebrated by writers and poets. People enjoyed the sight of fallen leaves, the odor, 
the sound, and the feeling of walking through them. We understand that leaves should be collected before the first snowfall, but does the city have to collect them day after day for weeks on end? In this era of limited resources, when our city government is facing budget problems and is asking for property owners to increase their tax burden, why not reduce this non-essential expenditure by letting the leaves linger for us to enjoy? Why not let the grass grow a bit longer? It will look greener and diminish the bare spots. Why mow the entire lawn, even during a drought? Besides, leaf blowers and detachers are actually harmful to existing grass. Leaf blowers subjected to hurricane force winds, and detachers break up the roots. Fred and I keep asking ourselves, when did leaves and grass become the enemy? We've been told that much of this work is done because people have paid a substantial sum for perpetual care for graves. Is all this cemetery equipment and maintenance activity paid for and maintained by the Perpetual Care Fund? Or is it paid for at least partially through general tax revenue? And just how sustainable is the current level of care? If the perpetual in perpetual care is to be taken literally, how will this level of care be maintained when gas is 10 or $15 a gallon? And when the cemetery is filled and there are no more additions to the fund's capital, it seems only logical to assume that the less you draw down the fund now, the more will be available to provide perpetual care in 2050, 2100, 2300, and so on. Conversely, the more you spend now, the less will be available down the road, and the more of a burden this obligation will be to the city in future years. As you all know, we are facing a climate crisis. We, the residents of this city and our representatives, will be judged by our response. Fred and I own a thousand square foot home. We rarely purchase meat because it uses a great deal of grain and water to produce. We compost. We purchase electricity from 100% renewable sources. We drive our car less than 3,500 miles annually. We've used fluorescent bulbs for years. When our 1959 cooktop bit the dust about two years ago, we purchased an induction cooktop that is 84% efficient. We have a battery powered lawnmower. Since we both have disabilities, the people we hire to rake leaves and shovel snow, uh, we hired people who actually use rakes and snow shovels, never a leaf blower, weed whacker, or snow blower. We are doing our best not to contribute to this problem, and we cannot, in good conscience, witness what is happening in our backyard without voicing our concerns. We're not asking you to buy or build anything. We are asking you to help the climate and the city shortfall by cutting the grass, trimming the weeds, and collecting the leaves less often. This will leave more money for teachers and first responders, more money for infrastructure, including roads and bridges, more money for the perpetual care of graves to which the city is committed. If DPW were to suspend mowing the unused portions of Spring Grove and cut the mowing, leaf blowing, weed whacking, power washing, deep etching, which I think is a new activity, and other activities at the rest of the cemetery in half, the facility's carbon footprint would also be cut substantially without a significant impact on Spring Grove's general appearance. We know this because we've lived by the cemetery for years before this maintenance schedule became the new normal, and the cemetery was more beautiful, more peaceful, and more enjoyable. If our green community, with its avowed commitment to sustainability, won't take readily achievable steps to reduce its carbon footprint, then we fear for the prospects for our city, our nation, and our planet. For the sake of our environment, and for the welfare of our city, and the peace of this lovely cemetery and our neighborhood, we ask you please to respectfully consider our request. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Did you have some more comments? Yeah, we have, um, we have a letter um, um, well, actually, we have um, copies of the statement. We have the emissions test that was done, that Denise referred to, that was done by Edmonds, with the specific details of the comparisons between um, leaf uh, blowers that meet California standards and the cars <coughs> that she was talking about. Um, and these were new leaf blowers, by the way, and uh, from, I think, Home Depot. And we also have a petition um, that has been signed by uh, quite a few people in our neighborhood. Just uh, in the cul-de-sac, we just asked people 
mostly who were immediate brothers and some other people who we knew had expressed interest. So should I hand this to Lily's? Do I, I've got copies pretty much for everyone, so. And the letter from Lily Lombard, she's a resident uh, who has, I guess, as we, as we understand it, complained in previous years about similar activity at the Bridge Street Cemetery. They have a copy. She uh, wanted it to be read out loud. I don't know if you've got time for that. But it's short. Shorter. Whatever. Um, I can do it real quickly. Um, Fred Pelka, that's me, phoned me recently seeking advice about how to engage effectively the city in addressing environmental and noise disturbance at the Spring Grove Cemetery. He described the exhausted but unsuccessful attempts that he and his housemate, Denise Carew, have made to appeal to the DPW, his ward counselor, the City Sustainability and Energy Committee, and the Board of Public Works. Mr. Palka didn't know this when he called, but his description of his experience and frustration immediately took me back to my family's years living at 4 Orchard Street between 2002 and 2005, where our home directly abutted the Bridge Street Cemetery. For my family, the daily loud noise and pollution of the DPW's lawn machinery at the Bridge Street Cemetery literally kept my two young children from wanting to play in their own backyard. I recall questioning then DPW Director George Andrikaitis and Cemetery Director Rich Parasoliti about the need for such constant petroleum powered grounds maintenance, and even went before the DPW to present examples of cemeteries throughout the U.S. that are more park-like, treed, and naturalist in design, where people picnic, bird life feels welcome, and tree droppings serve as mulch for garden beds. Unfortunately, my conversations did not affect DPW practice, and my family moved from Orchard Street and away from the immediacy of this problem. Today, however, new voices of concern are bringing this problem to your table and asking for your help. I encourage the DPW and DPW to take a fresh look at the maintenance practices of cemetery grounds. There are two compelling reasons to do this. One, sustainability. Northampton has embraced sustainability as the core consideration in its master plan. With budget cuts straining our fiscal sustainability and fossil fuel-driven global warming threatening the planet's very habitability, and this is not an overstatement, and all essential practices that are not all non-essential practices that cost money and use fossil fuel must be scrutinized. Two, to be good neighbors. If non-essential practices are seriously damaging the quality of life of one's neighbors, wouldn't any decent neighbors seek alternatives? The abutters of Spring Grove Cemetery have gone to great effort to have their concerns taken seriously and certainly outendured my attempt to effect change at the Bridge Street Cemetery. They are not persisting because this is a trifling annoyance. They experience daily stress from the noise, have witnessed the flight of wildlife from the cemetery, and care deeply about their neighborhood, their city, and the planet's well-being. I thank you for inviting this conversation and urge you to see your cemetery neighbors as allies in finding a solution to this problem that benefits all. Sincerely, Lily Lombard. Thank you. And to also ask the neighbors, we went uh, door to door and talked to the people we could, um, and asked them to sign a statement that basically is uh, in agreement with what we're suggesting here. And part of the reason for doing that is uh, we were told when we uh, first raised concerns about Spring Grove Cemetery that you're the only people who've ever complained. And Lily told us that she was told, you're the only people who ever complained. And some of our neighbors have told us that they were told, they're the only people who ever complained. So we just figured we'd you know, kind of put it on the table that here are a raft of people who are complaining. And some of our neighbors are here, one of our neighbors. When one neighbor I know came in early and had to leave, but I know she spoke with some of you, so that was good. I don't know if you want to talk to Denise's statement. We, we have that. And, uh, oh, not tonight. the statement. Yeah. Okay. And this is the... Um, the Edmund study. This is the Edmund study. Oh, yes. I see. Yes. We'll get this distributed to the board. Okay. That'd be great. Does the board have any comments or um, questions? Betsy, hey, did you want to say anything? I know you were. Well, I, of course, lived up only 10 years in um, Burn Cole, but um, I definitely have noticed also mm -hmm. the increase of maintenance uh, almost constant <laughs> um, in, in the summertime. It just seems so, uh, it just used to be much far more peaceful and um, the noise level was, uh, maybe it's because I'm getting older that I'm getting more sensitive to the noise level, but I, it, I definitely feel that it has increased. 
and it's excessive. That's, that's the, the noise. Well, one thing that you know, we want to point out, I mean, there definitely has been a change in the sense of mowing all of the area at Spring Grove, whether or not it's being prepared for new graves or not. Um, and that's, that's a fair amount of the, of the area there. It's maybe a quarter to a third of the available area. And that used to be left to grow. Or maybe, it was, maybe it was mown once or twice a year. Now it seems as though it's mown all the time. You can go there and you can see the area we're talking about. It's the area that goes up to the hill, the, the, the peak of the hill, the area that is along um, North Farms Road, I think that is, and, and, and sort of wraps around that. And that all used to be just left wild. And, I, I and lupins grew every spring. Yeah, it was, it was you know, people would, would go there and see the flowers and the birds. <laughs> and I don't see what the point is of adding that to the maintenance regimen. And that alone would probably cut the, the noise level you know, by a quarter, a third maybe. And, and there used to be, we used to see wild turkeys in there and you know, all kinds of and more bluebirds. And, I mean, it was just, uh, you know, more critters. It was, it, it was a wonderful area, sometimes deer, um, mm -hmm. and it's just, they're just not there anymore. And we also used to see more people would come and like just park their car by their children's graves, usually it was like older parents, you know, who would just sit there and have lunch or just sit there and meditate. Or some people have benches that they bought instead of stones, and they would come and they would picnic there. And we just don't see that anymore. Okay, thank you. Mike? Good. Can we set our own standards for maintenance, or are we are we um, obligated to meet some standard that's set by some other entity? Yeah, I don't think it's set by an entity. Um, uh, the board actually looks over the cemeteries and signs off on the plots and so on. And even though City Hall takes care of the perpetual care fund, mm -hmm. which a lot of that interest comes back to fund the cemetery division, uh, the board can set policies they've set in the past. Uh, Changes in pricing schedules, times that would be open, not open, and so on. Mm -hmm. oh, I have yes. Um, I, I was actually expecting to hear that there were concerns about ancillary activities that were being based out of the cemetery, but it, it, it appears to me from your comments that this is really just your concerns are focused on the maintenance of the cemeteries themselves and not any other city work that, that's going on at that facility. Actually, uh, I mean, we didn't, we, we didn't, we didn't want to kind of pile on too much. There are two things that, that seem to be new. And one is related to cemetery maintenance, and the other does seem to be ancillary. And uh, the, 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 one, the, the ancillary things are power washing. Um, there, there's been power washing, I think, of plows, because I've gone over there while they're doing it. And they actually power washed the barn, which, you know, in February, in February which seemed kind of superfluous in overdoing it. Um, the other thing, and I guess it's related to the cemetery maintenance, but what they're doing now is they're taking a diesel, it looks like a diesel-powered compressor, and they're forcing uh, air through the underground plumbing system. This is how it was explained to us. So it's this hideously loud machine that comes by in the spring and in the autumn, I think. Mostly in the autumn. In the autumn. And More than once. Yes, and, and, and goes down the roads, and, and what we've been told is that this is forcing air through the underground plumbing. For, like, an irrigation system? Yeah. yeah. I guess. Or, or an irrigation system. Don't have system. an irrigation no. system. No. It's, it's, no. it's just to water for people to fill water. Through the taps. Okay. But I think what they used to do is just open the taps and leave them open, and that's how they... In the winter, yeah, drain it. And no, drain, drain the water out and turn the water off. Um, so this seems to be a new thing. And the other thing is several people have talked to us about, I mean, the noise of people coming early in the morning to pick up uh, trucks that are destined for other places in the city. And, you know, so the noise of people coming in, the noise of trucks going out, the noise of equipment going back and forth all day. There was, um, a, there was a particular neighbor who was concerned about that, and she was going to be here, but um, she didn't show, so. Does anybody else from the group have any comments on this? No. Anybody else from the uh, board? So what I'm hearing you say, Ned, you mentioned that you didn't think that the policies have changed in how many years? Would you 20. Say? 20 years? According okay. to Rich Parcel. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there some uh, different policies the board could reconsider that might minimize um, the amount of mowing that happens or, or 
What were your thoughts on that? I don't think the board, of, there is any policy governing the actual care of the activities that are taking place and the schedule of those. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the board is typically the one setting the fees, the structure for up there, hours of operations as necessary, uh, changes in burial costs versus perpetual care costs, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Do we uh, utilize uh, the same maintenance schedule across all the cemeteries that we that Yes. We do? Okay. They all on a uh, regular maintenance schedule. None of the cemeteries are irrigated. So the, when the grass grows, they cut it when it's a reasonable length. Uh, we talked to Rich Elm. He's kind of an expert on turf work. Mm -hmm. And you don't want your grass to get too high before you cut it because it damages the roots and, you know, it's not healthy for the lawn. But, you know, there's a maintenance that we do. Mm -hmm. um, at those facilities. Uh, as far as blowing out the water lines, I'm sure it's done in the fall before winter. Mm -hmm. You can't have frozen pipes. I don't believe that the water lines are buried five feet deep like we do city water mains because mm -hmm. they are a, a seasonal type event. So they're probably very shallow, a foot or two deep, mm -hmm. and they would break the water in the, in the winter time. So I, I, I don't believe that they have any back drains in any of the, uh, the fountains up there, so, or not the fountains, but the uh, water lines that would go into like a uh, stone pit to bleed itself out like they do for yard hydrants at barns. Mm -hmm. One of the comments, oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, um, I, I do have a recollection of the area that didn't have graves not being mowed much. I used to play as a kid out in those fields, so mm -hmm. I remember the grass mm -hmm. being pretty high. I'm just curious if that's something that we could revisit or if there's a rationale to... to I don't have the answer for you on that, but I can I can ask Rich about that. It was my understanding that those are held once a year, those areas of future cemetery expansion that are years down the road. And it makes sense to do road. it, you know, once or twice a year. I think just yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll check into that. If you could check on the schedule. Yeah. And one of the comments of the public was that, that there was daily mowing. Is, and did Rich say there was daily mowing? There's mowing? quadrants. They divided the cemetery into quadrants, so every area gets mowed on a regular basis as basically talking to Bill Sullivan about it, by the time they finish mowing the cemetery, it's time to go back to the first quadrant again. Yeah. So it is a perpetual care. Yeah, right, right. It's like so, Gate Bridge. Bridge. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. so you mentioned that you're going to go to the Sustainability Commission, so I'm wondering if we should um, wait and hear what the Sustainability Commission says, but also maybe re-examine some some of the policies that we could possibly retrench on. I'll, I'll pull up anything I can find and I'll share that with the board. Okay. Thanks, Any other thoughts? Okay, thank you very much. Can I just say, I mean, I, I hear what Director Huntley is saying, but it really was our experience that like last summer, for example, in the middle of the drought, when just nothing was growing, they were out mowing every single day, throwing up just huge clouds of dust. I mean, we didn't need to mow at all, and our lawn is right next to the cemeteries, so it didn't seem like anything was growing where you all are either, but it was just that, you know, what we were told by employees at the time was just that, you know, this is the way we do it, we do it like this, and, mm -hmm. and I think uh, it would be helpful to reconsider that. One of the things we suggested in an earlier uh, email that we sent to you was that, because this is, I think this is a, 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 a point of contention here, um, and that is that just basically there'd be a baseline taken, that uh, somebody keep a log of, of the actual activities that are happening so that we know what's happening because it seems as though, I mean, when we call uh, the DPW office here and say they're mowing right now, what we're told is, oh, that can't be. You know, because uh, that last summer, for example, they would begin early on, uh, sometimes 6 o'clock in the morning. 6.30 usually. Yeah, what we were told was that we're doing it earlier so that people don't work in the heat of the day, which is fine, but there needs to be sort of an acknowledgement of that. Jim? Um, I haven't really worked on this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say something anyway. And it seems like what there there's I, I appreciate the, the comments that these folks have. Mm -hmm. um, big boys are noisy, and the things that they're saying certainly make a certain amount of sense to me. Um, the flip side is I don't know the details of how we maintain the cemeteries, but and and there seems to be some discrepancy between. We're saying that we haven't changed anything, and they're saying that they've noticed a change. Mm -hmm. And I think, in a way, that discrepancy is a little bit, um, it's a little irre irrelevant. I think, at a minimum, we can go back and look at the policies of how we maintain the cemeteries mm -hmm. and the activities that we do, what time of year we do certain things, what time of day we do certain activities, 
all these sorts of things and take and revisit that to see if there's a way to reasonably maintain the cemeteries um, and keep them looking good and meet people's expectations from that from that standpoint while maybe cutting back on, on some things. And I don't know if, if we can or not. And like mm -hmm. I said, I haven't really, really worked on this, mm -hmm. but it, it's noticeable that these folks are saying, yeah, there's a lot more stuff going on. And mm -hmm. we're saying, well, 20 years, nothing has really changed. Mm -hmm. But um, it seems like a, a review of, of what we do would make sense. And MJ's comment about the area that maybe we don't need to mow that area. And that could be a pretty quick solution to a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. but the rest of it too about, um, you know, if it's, if we're in a drought, how many times yeah. do you need to mow? Exactly. I mean, these are pretty reasonable questions, I think. And yeah. and again, I don't I don't know the details like Ned does or Rich Parcelletti does or Dr. Sullivan, but to me, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to to revisit the practices. And is there, you know, it's it's always good in my mind if someone has a question to go back and reevaluate what we've been doing. We've been doing something apparently the same same way for years and years and years, and mm -hmm. never it never hurts to go back and revisit the way. We, Exactly. Okay. That's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? So thank you so much for having me. That was just that we didn't want to put this in writing because we didn't want to get whoever told us this in trouble. But um, once, you know, one of the, the main reason that, that the cemetery agreed to kind of shift their timing, Fred went and talked to one of the employees. Well, I, I want to back up. We, okay. we, we, yeah, maybe we're, we're taking a lot of time, but. We, we had called a number of times to say, if you're going to begin this early in the morning, could you at least begin sort of on the other side of the cemetery where there aren't houses abutting directly on the property? And we'd called and left messages and maybe sent emails, I don't know. Um, and it just hadn't happened. And then at one point at 7 in the morning, you know, somebody began right under our bedroom window. And I kind of got dressed and went out and had my little camera and confronted them and, and said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we, you know, you have called and we know you called but it would be better if you came in person and talked to the people which I thought was kind of weird and then um, I mean he, and he agreed and he, he went off uh, um, but what he, what he said was well you know if you're expecting peace and quiet why did you move next to a cemetery and I thought that was an awfully peculiar comment <laughs> thank you for adding some humor to our evening <laughs> thank you very much for we coming often, we often get told oh you must have quiet neighbors <laughs> and I say well Thank, thank you for, thank uh, you for taking, taking the time. time. Yeah, and, thank and you. We'll be here, yes. sure and we will much. look into some of these matters. So thank you very and, much. And we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, appreciate it. Great. It looks like we won't have item number two. The Deborah Toledo is not here. I'd like to open up this discussion for item number four, new business, discussion of the rules and procedures for public comments. Anybody would like to open this up? I think that would be a wise thing for us to establish some guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I find it, um, how am I, doing? I, I keep on trying to figure out how we best balance um, people coming and talking to us about things that are on the agenda in advance of them in advance of uh -huh. us discussing the agenda. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious on how other committees in town have chosen to handle that. And I would hope that we might offer people the opportunity to say their piece in the public moment. Mm -hmm. But if it's on the agenda, not to really engage in a conversation until it's on our agenda. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Could we review the uh, city council and the school committees? Procedures, rules, whatever they call them. I assume they have them. But I don't the, the city council should do that. Yeah. Uh, Terry was going to uh, are you going to get those or just shutting the door? Um, that there's a three minute limit for the city council, is that right? Right. And the city council don't engage in any sort of conversation. They just, yes. I understand just they just state your piece and, and whether it's an agenda item or not, it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. oh. I'll get you three minutes to do your thing. So if I'm understanding you correctly, saying the difference between public comments and agenda, the agenda we would engage, and in public comment we would just listen. Mm -hmm. Do we want to have is everybody in agreement with that? Not completely. Okay. It, it seems to me that our practice has always been to engage, mm -hmm. to respond if we had something to clarify or explain our position. So. Uh, I think we'd find. I think we'd struggle if if we adopted a a practice that said just tell us what's on your mind. 
Because I think they expect to hear a response from mm -hmm. us, and, and I think that's probably a good thing that we they do that. Um, so I, I, I kind of like a mix. I, I certainly think it makes sense to, if it's an agenda item, not deal with it in the public comment section, but deal with it under the agenda item. We, we struggled at a, at a committee. conference committee um, at our last meeting because we thought we needed to let people speak in the public comment section, and they were speaking to agenda items, mm -hmm. and then we all of a sudden found ourselves evolving into that agenda item, and so mm -hmm. we it wasn't the most controlled no. situation because we were trying to feel <laughs> and our I was way through. To it. Share it. I was like, wow. What's going on? Here? <laughs> so I do think it makes a lot of sense to, if it's clear that they want to speak to an agenda item, wait until the item comes up, and then let them speak whenever it's appropriate. I mean, I, I think we should let them if, if they say that it's on the agenda. I think we. If they, want, if they start talking and it's on the agenda, and we recognize that it's an item on the agenda, we can say very nicely to them, it's number four on our mm -hmm. agenda, if you'd like to stay and we'll, you know, we'll deal with it, responding to it at that point. Yeah. But the chair could also identify, are you speaking to an agenda item or a public comment, and then distinguish comments for the public that way. However, wonder if something's not on the agenda, it would require a comment from the board. I would leave it up to the discretion of the chair. I think so. Yeah. Rather than asking that um, it be put on the agenda in the future. Yes. I think that I think that's I think that's something we ought to also consider, which is if it's sufficiently thought provoking, you might want to end, add it to the agenda. But I want to bring up. Um, a, a different situation um, that we've encountered at the Stormwater Committee where um, public comment has effectively hijacked the process. Um, and what we've experienced is the same people re-airing the same issue at, at multiple meetings and multiple times in the meeting. And part of that has to do with the fact that at one of our earlier meetings, Council Inspector came in and said, we really want this to be an interactive process, and I think we took them too literally. Um, so I just offer that as a cautionary tale um, because we're, it, I, I've complained to the, the chair and co-chair that I, I think that um, that responding to the individual concerns of people who come in with specific problems is is, is important, but given what the, 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 the context of this task force is, it's 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 gobbling up our time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that as being necessarily the same problem we've encountered here, but I just. Uh, Add my support for more rather than less structure. Mm -hmm. For more rather than less structure. Jim. Um, just an observation that through the board meetings, when people come, I would say like more than 90% of the time, people come for a specific item on the agenda. Sure. Mm -hmm. We don't generally have people coming out wanting to just relay some idea or concept to the board. So mm -hmm. usually, you know, it's tied to an agenda item, as Mike suggested. You know, you, you guys do a pretty good job at rearranging the agenda to address people that are here for a specific, mm -hmm. specific item. Mm -hmm. It seems to work pretty well, I think. I think the issue I'd like to lay out for people to think about is wonder if someone brings up something we think is going to engender a lot of comment, should we, and it's not on the agenda, and yet to ask them to come back another time, or if we think it's going to take more than three, if we allocate three minutes, and we think it's going to take more than three minutes, would we then put it on the agenda for another time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're all, okay, yeah, so that's yeah, that an sense. agreement on that. Okay. And that's why the chair needs some discretion mm -hmm. when when the individual expresses their um, their topic. Okay. Because some topics probably, if somebody's here to complain about a pothole, can be dealt with very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if it's some far-ranging planning issue, then I think it gets put on the agenda for a later date. And so we, we won't know that. Yeah. In, so I think that's why the chair needs the flexibility to, okay. to deal with that. But should every pothole be an open uh, target? Well, I think we're obligated, we're being encouraged, and maybe we're being told, I'm not sure which, <coughs> to have a public comment period. And, well, yeah, well, mandate. Mandate. Okay. So then if, if someone wants to come in and complain about a pothole, I think they can. Right. Within three minutes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Move on. That's right. That's right. Right. That's right. I agree. Cemetery noise. Excuse me. 
How about cemetery noise that took you 30 minutes to deal with tonight? It was on the agenda. It still was a public comment more than airing their. I mean, that was. I think my result in some changes. And they communicated with us in advance, gave us some background information. We had a chance to view it. You know, this has been. There's been a couple of emails that we've seen on this issue. So it seemed appropriate for it to, to be an agenda item. Okay, I'm just going to summarize where we are to this point, and then people can have more comments. So that we will have a public comment period in uh, asking people if they want to make com public comment for three minutes. If it looks like it's something that requires our comment, we would ask to put it on the agenda. If it's people that want to, um, if it's people that want to speak to something on the agenda, we would ask them to defer their comments. And there would be some discretion on uh, reply or putting it on the agenda for another time at the, at the uh, behest of the chair. Is that we have all, is that, are we agreement to that point? Well, one thing that I've always appreciated about this board is that if a person has a question as you're discussing an item that maybe they weren't fully aware of before, but sometimes really interesting stuff comes up here, that you would still answer questions. Would that be something that you would still do? Was that a practice you would still use, or would it have to be? Like, I'm just curious about that, because I, I like the opportunity to sometimes ask for a question when you guys are talking about something I'm not aware of. Or, so I don't know if that's something that would still be a practice that you do. Any comments? Well, I think that when, uh, when it's an agenda item, that's certainly been our practice, too, yeah. you know, to sort of discuss it among ourselves. And then we open it up to... Um, the public who aren't sitting around the table to participate in the conversation. But I think the public comment is a different animal in that people are coming, they want to make sure that we're hearing it with our own ears, what they're saying to us. Uh, and it seems, um, and sometimes we can respond to that quickly. Now, to get the rest of the crowd involved in a, a question and answer a conversation about this one person's item, I think would not be productive for us at that time. So. Did I answer your question? If it's on the agenda, right. I, I, I don't see that we're going to change any our practices of how we deal with the agenda items in terms of engaging the community. Jim, we're, we're up to date. Okay, I, think, I think there's something in the open meeting law that, that speaks to the agenda, and the idea being that you can't sneak something into the agenda because you didn't want to notify the public that it was going to be on the agenda. Sure. So mm -hmm. the, the purpose of the agenda is, is to tell the public what's going to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So, you, and I think you see, we, we can see that in the ad hoc committee's agenda. Good God, yes. Yeah, I mean, they're bringing up agenda items just out of the blue. It's really, it's really frustrating. Yeah. But if you look at the written agenda, yeah. it, it seems like they're trying to not do it. So um, would the, go oh, ahead. I was going to say, I, just to follow up on your, I would hope that whatever solution we come up with would maintain that same sort of collegiality, and whether it, we don't, whether we don't write it into whatever our, you know, but we just sort of operate under under those that that sort of spirit. I, I would, I would, that would be my hope that we can do that. Um, it's usually an intimate enough room that we don't have a problem with guys, you know, firebombing the place. So. David, I want to make sure I understand your comment. Your comment is that items that are already on the agenda, people people comment on that, but we don't want to add to the agenda because it's a no. public agenda already. No, I think I think we're open. We should be open as we are to a comments mm -hmm. period you know, mm -hmm. about anything. But people coming in with their agenda, you know, with with a bunch of people, and mm -hmm. in effect forcing themselves into the agenda mm -hmm. it presents you know us discussing an item that's not an agenda item. But in other words, the public didn't know that this particular group, whoever they are, was going to put something on the agenda mm -hmm. through this backdoor process. Right. Comments in the well, well, I think that, I mean, with public comment, we're sort of hearing what's on the mind of the public that mm -hmm. we might not hear otherwise. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, and then I think that in that case, then, and if, if it requires a decision or a change of policy or a reconsideration of our policy, then it should be put on as a future agenda item. And I think that that's what we need to rely on the chair to sort of see those lines and to make a decision about how to move it forward. But for us not to make a decision either in responding to somebody who's talking during public comment, a, a major policy shift, I, I think that we, we tend to be cautious about 
making big decisions and tend to sort of err on the, on the side of being more prudent and, and uh, researching and taking a little time to think about things. I think we're, we're good in that way. And, and I, would, I would submit that the three-minute limit does put us in a position where we can end that, that type of you mm -hmm. know, work around um, just by saying, okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to do you want to see us put this on an agenda for a future discussion? I think also we have the responsibility that we have to uh, we have to publish the agenda, and so the fact that we can't have right. too many errant we can't have errant issues because they aren't on the published agenda. So right. we have public comment, we have people speaking to the agenda, and then we have the fact that on future agendas we would put the information on. As someone who's made public comment before the city council, I get my two or three minutes and don't expect much more. And there may be a question asked from the city councilor, once my three minutes are up, mm -hmm. that's it, and the agenda is the agenda. Yeah, it seems to work. It works. Mm -hmm. But if you open it up to, I and mean, I'm saying what we just saw tonight, you know, a lot of this was extraneous stuff that wasn't really addressed at the problem, the mm -hmm. direct problem. It could have been done in five minutes instead of 30 minutes. And you could have had a chance to make your comments rather than listen to a lecture on many things. So any more comments from the board on this? Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking that we should have this in a written format based on the minutes and then just have one more discussion of it next time? Or does that seem excessive? No, we should probably have a motion, don't you think? Yeah, but I'm not, I don't want to have a motion without something. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everybody happy? Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, we should probably also give Terry the opportunity to weigh in. Yeah, oh, probably. Since he's the chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Guess what you have to do. <laughs> All right. Um, ready to move on to contracts? Okay. Mm -hmm. Contract for a leak detection survey to DSM Solutions in the amount of $13,350. I don't have an amount on mine. Maybe I, 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 oh, you know what, I'm probably using oh, yeah, my version. Yeah, yeah, I have a new Sorry. version, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I got right, you. I have the extra one. I have the new version. Uh, I think it's the extra one. Oh, that, this is the next one. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. I move up. Second. Second. Uh, this is a requirement every three years for DEP. So this is our third year. We had three quotes on this ranging from uh, $13,350 uh, up to $34,700. Um, two years ago, um, this was $93 per mile. This year it's $89 per mile. Uh, DSM is the same company we used uh, last time. And this, this is water mains. This is water mains. Uh, questions? Just come the whole soon? Yes. Oh, okay. Not bad. Not bad. Did you math? How many miles ago? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? 89 miles. 89 miles. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Number six, contract for engineering services for 20-inch water transmission main condition evaluation to Tata and Howard. Um, in the amount of $32,500. Second. This is an engineering contract to do an alternatives evaluation and condition assessment of the 21-inch uh, 20 water transmission main that was installed back in the turn of the century, I guess. In 1906, 1906. The last century. So it runs from Mountain Street Reservoir basically down to into the Leeds. And, um, Cross country line was installed by hand back in the good old days. Um, it's one of a, one of two transmission mains that we have that, that come down into the city. Um, Tate and Howard had identified it as um, a potential weak point in the system, and in a, in a draft uh, in the draft water asset management plan, they actually suggested they were replaced to the tune of six million dollars, and we had decided that. Wolf Warren undertaking a six million dollar project that might make sense to do a little bit closer look at the, an evaluation of the pipe and also to look at um, potential alternatives to either um, clean and line the pipe in place or replace a section of it or whatever the case may be. So 
this study is, is intended to look at those alternatives and provide some options for us to consider. So it's just to look at the options? Yep. Uh, MJ, did, is that the new report that we just received? We have not received that report yet. That report that you just referenced? That is true. You make sure how we can do that. It's amazing. <laughs> He's pretty amazing. He's a good guy. I said, I said yes. you received the draft report. Okay. Oh. 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 Which, <laughs> she <words. laughs> Which needs to be revised before we're really interested in sharing it with the board or the public, for that matter, because there are some things in there that weren't accurate and other stuff that need to be corrected. Um, but we're hoping to have that within a couple of weeks. Well, you're oh, sorry, I was going to say, going? you're confident that in its draft format, this is well, you know, one of the things that my turn. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I will say to address that, MJ, that one of the projects that was, that was in the draft report was the replacement of the transmission main for $6 million. Okay. And Ned and I were like, well, we probably want to look at alternatives before we undertake a $6 million project. So this is fairly short money, I think, to make sure we're spending money wisely in terms of the transmission. Thank you. Uh, first, Mike, can you, Jim, can you explain why they consider it to be a weak point in the system? Um, I think because of the age and the fact that it's cross-country and um, it's inaccessible in many areas. And um, I don't think that uh, you know, it's basically inaccessible in, in a number of areas. So we rely on it for redundancy to, to transmit water to the city. But um, the city has had concerns about the condition of that for years. Um, and one of the reasons that it turns out to be important is that in the past and currently, we have a pressure reducing valve up in Waynesburg that reduces the pressure in that line. And one of the things that we're looking at to reorient um, the pressures in the water system is to take that pressure reducing valve off up at the top of the hill and have, <coughs> and have this line carry more pressure into leads. So we can save on some pumping costs and leads if we can, if this line can carry more pressure. So in order to implement that recommendation that Tate and Howard has to reduce our, our need to pump and leads, we could pump, we could flow by gravity, but this line has to carry a lot more pressure. And in the past, um, the department has not really been too interested in sort of pressurizing that line more than it needs to. Really? So, oh, sorry. So I, I did review the scope of this and gave the level of effort and pricing some thought, and it seems reasonable to me. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. David? It, it, uh, it sounds as though the actual leak experience hasn't been that bad. It, you have an understanding of potential problems, but have we had, really had a lot of leakage? Well, I think that's right. Uh, if there were a lot of leakage, it's hard to say because a lot of the pipes are accessible. It's under the ponds and generally so you wouldn't take a look at that. But the other issue is the pressure issue, which I mentioned, where we're carrying sort of minimal pressure in that line right now. And in the future, it would be beneficial to the city if, we could, if that line would carry pressure and then we could reduce our pumping costs for the, for the lead side pressure system. So it's part of a future improvement that we want to do, but. We handle this transmission main really with kid gloves because it's just, it's so old. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. We'll know at the end of this evaluation whether or not it can handle the increased pressure. We will have a record, yeah. Well, there is a possibility that they'll say some of the tests are not conclusive and they might recommend more. Uh, that's always possible. Well, they said they might. So they kept that option. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing definitive. You know, it's, it's yeah. this, you know, the length of the pipe and the condition. Yeah, no guarantees, but there'll be recommendations, maybe for more work. I don't know. What is it made from? It's cast iron. Did you hold my hand? I was just curious. Is that the one that goes under the Mill River by Worcester Cable? It cracks once. Contract for Engineering Services for Florence Road, Pine Street Bridge, 
crossing in Chestnut Street, water main improvements to Todd and Howard in the amount of $65,042. Move approval. She'll throw out of my own drafting drawing. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on. Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> Look at that. That's a disgrace. Um, this is a project um, to do some improvements on um, Pine, Pine Street Bridge over by 221 Pine, the Arts and Street building, and um, sort of a separate little project on, um, on Chestnut Street. So the this little picture that I just handed out shows sort of the scope of the work. Um, the current 24-inch um, cast iron transmission main cross system over by 221 Pine. And that, you can actually see it if you go onto that bridge and look. It's it's a little scary. I think um, anything could happen to that pipe and it carries a lot of water. So we're, we're trying to get that transmission transmission main hung off the bridge instead and out of the, out of the riverbed. Uh, and there's a couple of other little segments there. You can see a 12-inch line that runs from basically from Spring Street Extension down to Ryan Road. We'll, we'll do a connection there. And then um, the Pine Street connection runs from a stub um, at the intersection of Spring Street and Pine Street uh, up to near the intersection of Nantuck Street. So that's sort of the, the scope of the project. Um, mainly the goal is to do some cleanup there and get that transmission main out of the road. The, <coughs> the Chestnut Street piece, which is, uh, which is a little bit different, um, a different part of Florence, um, we decided to do this. This is actually uh, one of the one of the recommendations in the Tate and Howe draft study, which the board hasn't seen, um, is to replace that Chestnut Street water main from Main Street um, all the way up to Bridge Road. And I think for this, what we're looking at is just a replacement of the section from Cooper's um, up to High Street. So not too long of a section, but one of the reasons that we're looking at that is that um, we're looking at knowing and overlaying Main Street, right, for, mm -hmm. for paving. And we've had a couple of leaks recently at, the, at that intersection. You may have noticed um, we've been digging there the last year a couple of times because of cracks in the, in the water main. So the, the water main on Chestnut, there's a four-inch section um, that connects uh, on Main Street that was installed in 1871. And then the balance of Chestnut Street is an old six-inch um, cast line that was installed in 1927, which is pretty too regulated, we feel, at this point. So. Um, because we're doing the paving, we felt it would be a good time just to get that piece of broken pipe out of there and, and replace it. So, Kate and Howard's going to kind of bundle all this up into one bid and we'll get a contract that will hopefully get it soon. Uh, were you planning on putting the, the water main under the mill river? Is that what you said? Under the bridge. Under the bridge. There's a yeah. utility bay that's empty in the bridge. So, we had Kate and Howard has looked at that. We had a meeting with uh, Mascot Bridge Engineer. And right now, it's on the side of the bridge. Right now, it's on the it's on the, the bed of the river. Oh, it is right on now. the bed of the river. Uh, oh, I see. The, it's the red line. I have noticed that pipe. Mm -hmm. Wondered about it. Oh, hey, yeah, that big tree there. floating down. Yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. Anything. Anything. I did. Well, I, this is really a, a separate question. Information. How much of our water comes through the 20 inch as compared to the 36? It's about 50 50, I think, at this it's point. Probably, yeah. it's, it's, it's varied over time. I think we, we try to keep a balance. So it's about 50 50 at the moment. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Michael. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I talked to Jim about this one this afternoon. And we're, we're hoping the city, the deep department's hoping that the new pipe can be installed in this utility bay that's been left for a pipe on the bridge. Uh, on the bridge. Um, and they have a structural engineer uh, covered in this agreement to do the analysis to see if the bridge can support the weight. Because this is a 16 inch pipe full of water, is mm -hmm. a lot of weight. So I had suggested to Jim that. We encourage Tate and Howard to do that analysis first because it, they might find that the bridge can't support the weight of the pipe. And, and we need to know that, I think, as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I thought the effort and the pricing looked reasonable. Thank you. I want to 
wanted to just ask a question. You remember when Jim Gosto was um, wanting to have trucks prevented of a certain size of going across that bridge? It was Clement Street Bridge, if I recall correctly. Oh, you're right, you're right. Sorry. All right. Um, any That's other a questions? relatively new bridge. I mean, yeah. it's been built since I was born. I remember it was closed. <laughs> A lot of the bridges were washed out in the flood of 55. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was one of them. No, it was not one of them. Um, Gary? Uh, I do recall <laughs> the bridge was closed in April of 2007 because of high water in the river and, and the, um, in the bottom cord of the upstream carrying beam was underwater. And there's a lot of pressure there. I hope this pipe might be above the bottom cord of that upstream beam. Um, yeah. 1961. Mm -hmm. See? New. Practically brand new. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's opposed. Number no. vote. I don't have opposed. Oh. Okay. Yes, to say. Right. I need to leave in just a few minutes yeah. to get to do another meeting. You want to cover something else before um, you leave? I want to cover at least private ways at the minimum. Um, okay. Jim, I wasn't sure if you're comfortable with the style repair on Water Street. Sure. I can apply for that. Okay. okay. So I guess the big question is for private ways. We have a public hearing, six public hearings set this weekend. Mm -hmm. What time is it? does the board want to meet here? Quarter of nine again. Our first uh, street is Edgewood Terrace. Are we going to go in the order that uh, was listed? Uh, yes, We've already the got agenda. the agenda, right? I this sent it a long time ago. Can we send it again? I have it right here. Okay. Well, I would love to get it again. Cause I am okay, because I sent it like a month ago. I remember okay. getting it. Mm. So we so have that. It. Don't have it done. Okay. So we have that public meeting on, or hearings on Saturday from mm -hmm. 9 to 12, basically. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if the board wanted to consider looking at their May calendars to set up the next one. Right this minute? Um, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> it takes us at least three weeks to get the notices right. out because they're all yes. certified mail. Okay, so we have we have um, three, we have four weekends in um, do you think May. that the Hazardous Waste Collection? I understand. Well, then I want to go to Hazardous Waste Collection. Okay. Okay, there are a lot of other reuse activities. But you could go, go after 12, right? Um, well, I have an appointment. For Hazardous Waste? Mm -hmm. Hazardous Waste goes from 9 to 12. No. So we could start at 9.30. I have an appointment at 9.30. I've been given an appointment. Oh, you've already been yeah. given an yes. appointment. Oh, I didn't understand. You were way ahead. Okay, so we could start at 10 if it was that date. Are there other impediments for the 4th, the 11th, the 18th? The 11th is too soon for us to get everything done. Okay, the 25th, I would like to remind, I think it's um, Memorial Day weekend. It is. Oh, so you like the 18th. I don't care. I have nothing. I could, I could step away from whatever hearing's being held in the new journey. Or we could take the coffee break on Colossal Or chocolate we could All right, right. I don't want to be the cause of this group dispersing. Okay, so I'm going to propose and for comment uh, that we do our next public ways of... Private ways. On, private ways. A public hearing. Public ways. Public ways. Say this three times. I'm going to let you say it. On May 18th. Is that acceptable to everybody? Sure. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, maybe you could share with whomever makes up the agenda your 9.30 appointment and when you think you might get back. So... Yes, well, so, uh, being a board member, I, I bet you Mr. Parsons could contact Karen Bocon and have his opinion. Okay. I I would I would support you on that, and I bet other members of the reuse committee would also support you. I think you that's on. an inappropriate uh, use of power. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it only starts at nine. <laughs> Sorry, I mentioned it. Nice I, have to I, was, I was thinking <laughs> you, you could go at nine. You could 
Finally, a perk. I've been waiting for one. Then we can start our public hearings at 9.15. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
by extra. <laughs> extra. <laughs> Dick recommends you buy the contract limit this year. Okay. It must be a product of natural gas. I was going to say that that's got to be what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? All right. All those opposed? Number 10, contract for engineering services for the Mountain Reservoir Lowlift Pump Station Generator, uh, Chitata and Howard, I mean, uh, 66000 Move approval. Second. Second. This is a contract to do the engineering oversight, design and oversight for the installation of a new generator at the Lowlift Pump Station at the Mountain Street Reservoir. We don't have backup <coughs> power at that pump station, and we found that... Um, from a risk management standpoint, it would be good to have that power there. Uh, we had a potentially a big, a big problem during the hurricane. I mean, we, we had water quality problems in the Ryan Reservoir, and we had to rely on water from Mountain Street. And uh, we had lost power at the Mountain Street Reservoir at the Willow Pump Station. Our ability to provide water to the city would have been questionable. So we had, uh, last year we had, Tate and Howard did a, a review of generating alternatives for us, and they looked at the cost of doing um, uh, a gas generator, similar to what we have at the, at the water treatment plant, or diesel generator. And the diesel generator is a lot less expensive. Than this, um, what this design is based on is coming up with a design um, construction cost for diesel generator. Any questions or comments? Um, have we lined up the funding for the whole project? We have. Uh, how's that work? We have. Actually, it works like the money for this project was in the last year's budget, and we never got around to getting the project off the ground, so the money was encumbered into the upcoming fiscal year, and there it sits. So uh, money's available. So we're ready to go in there? Yep. So I had looked at the tasks and the level of effort on this one, and I thought it looked reasonable. Thank you so much. Okay, all those in favor? Sure. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. Change order number two to contract number 20413 for Waste Water Treatment Plant Electrical Testing Protocol and Observation to Client Elder in the amount of 37000 Move approval. Second. Last board meeting, we had a discussion about this um, electrical testing protocol, and at that time, there was a contract that was um, pulled off the agenda. And the, the contract that originally included Kleinfelder um, overseeing this electrical uh, test and observation, and, and it included uh, an electrical subcontractor who was going to do in excess of $100,000 worth of electrical work at the plant. That was uh, running a file of various procurement rules and and things. So uh, the route that the route that we need to go in order to have this testing protocol done and the electrical work at the plant is to go through a more traditional sort of design bid bid build, if you will, um, procedure on it. So this contract is for Kleinfelder to prepare the bid documents for the testing and the electrical work. It'll be publicly bid. Kleinfelder will oversee the work of the low bid electrical contractor. So it's a, it's a slightly different um, route in terms of procurement, but the, the testing and the work that will be done will be the same as what we've discussed a couple of times with the board. Should the price be approximately the same? Well, there's been some talk about competitive bidding helping um, reduce the price of the test, but I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I believe that. Um, but we'll find out. I, 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 I couldn't remember, but I actually what I remember last time I looked at this, it was 137000 or something. Am I remembering that right? 160000 Yeah. But I understood it, it did include all the electrical work. So, so that would be, I guess, the, the big cross of the dollars. So one of the added costs that 
we're faced with is we have to pay the engineer to prepare the bid documents and help us with the bidding process mm -hmm. that we weren't going to um, incur mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, and then I think Jim's right, you don't know how a contractor is going to view pricing, whether he's contracting with a private company such as an engineering company mm -hmm. or whether he's contracting directly with the city. And sometimes more contract requirements creep into the contract mm -hmm. and, and increase the cost. So although we're obligated to do it this way, and, and I understand it, we may end up paying a little bit more. Do we want to wait and do them as a group? Is that, are you suggesting No, that? no. We need the engineer to do his work before we can bid, yeah. bid the other. And, and again, I looked at this one, and I think this piece of it works reasonable. So. Okay. okay. All right, go ahead. Anybody else? I agree. I mean, it's, it's, theoretically, it will. I mean, it, it should cost more because they're they're going through all the design process and mm -hmm. putting together bin do, bin documents, probably helping with bid analysis. And so it's different than just design build. So it could cost more, but if we're compared to bidding, it might be about the same. But I don't think it would be less. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Stormwater and flood control. Stormwater and flood control. Um, um, previously, I don't know if I got to this part. No, you signed that one. I uh, know. Uh, you have two, yes? Yeah. Okay. You, you haven't signed. You haven't signed that one. Um, the affairs of state must take precedence over the affairs of state. Um, previously, we um, we. Adopted well, actually, this this past go round, we adopted a May 31st target deadline for submission to the city council of some form of draft fee schedule, uh, with the caveat that if we got as we got closer to that moment in time, if we felt we were close but not quite, we would ask for a short term extension. Um, at the last hearing, we entertained four, but really two. Um, Perspective fee schedules. Uh, one by Bob Reckman um, mirrored very closely the excellent um, uh, proposal put out by Terry. Um, and the other is a rather opaque um, presentation by Dan Felton. And the two philosophies are, are, are somewhat different. Um, Dan's an engineer and his proposal, his proposal <laughs> attempts to ascertain virtually lot by lot what what the, the fee based on impervious and, and pervious lands would be, and, and some acknowledgement that there would be an underlying fee to take care of the common the common areas. Uh, Terry's is a, also adopts a. a, um, a, 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 a Commons and 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 property <coughs> component, but his his approach to the property component is based on basically three tiers, based on total acreage of the lot. It's a much simpler form. Um, I've had some discussions with Jim, um, who has confirmed my concerns about Dan's Dan's approach to this, uh, which I think is untenable, uh, um, but. Again, these two are out there. We're going to be meeting again tomorrow. We're really accelerating our meeting schedule in an effort to get to hit the May 31st deadline, and I, I think it's possible and that we'll be able to make a recommendation. What the city council and, and I'll do with it, I don't know, uh, but that we'll be able to do something that's reasonable and 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 will embrace the both the transparency and the, and the equity argument. I think I think I, I don't think we're going to achieve perfection, but then again, I'm not sure what perfection looks like. Um, but I think Terry's model is a really, a really excellent piece of work, and I commend him for, for what he's done. Um, and then there were the administrative <coughs> hula hoops that we had to go through last go round uh, that that made the whole process convoluted. And um, I wrote to um, I thought chair, you were going to say bula hoops. That too. <laughs> um, I wrote to the chair and co-chair expressing my concerns about, and this is what I spoke about earlier about, you know, the pro appropriate level of public input. Um, 
and uh, I've been assured by the chairman that this issue is going to be addressed at, the, at tomorrow's meeting because really, particularly given the short, ter short turnaround time we're on, um, we don't have the luxury of unlimited public debate. We need, we need to solicit good, thoughtful ideas, but we also have to have the capability to cut it off when it, when it starts to spiral out of control. So I'm hopeful. I'm more hope. I, I, I'm hopeful we're going to be able to come up with something good, and that our work will be done by May 31st, and we can put it behind us and move on to just a sunnier pasture. And I see Jim wants to add something. If you're done, I am done. I guess for the benefit of the, uh, the board members that are on the joint committee, you should realize that there was a great deal of discussion and consternation about the May 31st deadline. Um, it was talked about for a while. Uh, because some members of the task force felt that it was inappropriate and lack transparency for there to be sort of this moving deadline and then a deadline given after they started their work. And some of the members felt that there wasn't suitable time to come up with a, a thoughtful response to the charge. So lots of discussion. There was some discussion about, you know, well, people could resign, they could do this, they could do that. And in the end, I think it was Chris actually came up with the idea that he said, well, you know, May 31st, if we work hard, we can get something done. And if by mid-May, it looks like we need more time, then we'll go back to the council and ask for a little more time. And, you know, we did talk about the basis. There was a lot of questions about, you know, why the 31st and where did that come from? And it came from me because I sent the email, which was a little sticky, although it wasn't my decision. Um, I blame the joint committee. Rightfully. <laughs> um, we should have gotten on June 1st. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do. <laughs> it would have been, would have been better. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, let, me, let, me just, yeah, let me just add, if you're done, Jim, let me just add to that. I think that, I think that at least a portion of the resistance to the May 31st deadline had less to do with how fast it was. Because I think, I think the majority of members can see that we can, in fact, do that. But there was at least one person, and he, I think, think he was the guy who voted against, there was one vote against on the motion, was that he didn't like the fact that, that a mandate was delivered on high halfway through the process. And I, I, I'm not unsympathetic to that, but I was able to, at least in my own mind, get around that and say our charge is more important than hurt feelings and that if the May 31st deadline is in fact realistic, we should, we should, try, to, we should try and meet it. So. Uh, can I thank you, Chris, for taking that stance? I think what we were concerned about in the conference committee is just the um, the necessity in moving forward and getting a dis some decisions made because of the scope of work that's on that's sort of looming in front of us. And and we hear that we hear that, but um, there is there's still a school of thought, and it's not going to go away. We're not going to get a unanimous vote on whatever the outcome is. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. um, How many I, people on the committee? Uh, that's a good question. I think at this point it's ten. We've lost at least one or two, mm. um, and but I think we've sure. I think the discussion about getting off the committee basically got people to commit to the fact that they weren't going to do it. That they mm -hmm. that, that that for them, they had taken on the responsibility and they wanted to see it through. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't mean they weren't going to be prickly along the way. <laughs> um, but I but again I think that you know two meetings ago it, we came to the realization that a short term deadline was meet, meetable if we narrowed our focus and the fact that four people individually I, I, with help I'm sure came up with you know four proposals for last week's meeting in the space of a two week time frame is encouraging there's an acknowledgement that we can get this done so it's really down to these two sort of and and we haven't seen a new a, a new a fifth proposal hasn't reared up, so I think we're really focused on the differences between these two. And I think at the end of the day, at least where I am, Terry, Terry's some form of Terry's initiative is going to prevail. I think the only thing I wanted to add to it was that there was a lot of discussion about um, the fact that this is a big decision for the city as a whole, and that the task force is grinding away in relative anonymity. I mean, a few people have been coming to the meetings. We've been doing, you know, meetings are obviously posted. We have everything on our website, on the city's main website. Um, the, the meetings are videotaped, as you know, like the board meetings are, and they're put up on YouTube, and we have links to that stuff on our website. All the technical information that the task force is using is available for people. Um, but there was a fair amount of discussion as well about, um, you know, how, do, how does the word get out more so people are, are aware of it in the city? Um, so 
So those talked about quite a bit, and I think the chair and vice chair of the task force have indicated that, you know, they're, they're trying to do what they can within the charge of the task force. Eventually, this is going to end up back at the joint committee level, the board level, and then the city council. So there'll be more, you know, there'll be more process and more discussions and more public meetings as, as things, as time goes on. But, you know, for, for example, the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce came to the meeting and offered to help sort of get the word out. Um, I think it, it's a little perplexing what to do, and I, you know, you wonder why the Gazette doesn't cover it a little bit more. They've had certainly articles about the need for flood control improvements and stormwater permits and, you know, those implications, there's been some coverage. And Bob Reckman, who's on the task force, it indicated that perhaps the press coverage will increase once the task force makes its recommendation and things get moving a little bit more in that way. And then someone in the meeting said, well, don't you want to get more input when you're trying to determine what an equitable fee structure is? But eventually, it's it's up to the city council as an ordinance required. Um, so there'll, there'll be more process, but clearly people on the task force recognize that it's an important issue for the city, and um, you know, I, I just it's a little perplexing to them. How, how do we get the word out a little bit more? Uh, so. But I also felt it was appropriate to make the point that I'm not going to punish myself because our due diligence hasn't gotten people in the door. You know, but I, I think we would benefit from. A, I mean, literal. What we what we're experiencing is the usual suspects. Showing up repeatedly, presenting their viewpoints on a narrow on a narrow focus of issues, and we would certainly benefit from a broader cross section of the community giving us input. But that's the conundrum, which is you know how do you, how do you make that happen? And uh, it's a tough it's a tough it's a tough call. No, I have a, we'll have at least two public hearings. Yeah. One for the board and one for the city. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean you know as Jim points out, we're not the, we're we're the first round in this. We are not the court of last resort. You know, so uh, hopefully, hopefully we will get better input later on. And you know, it's conceivable. I hope it doesn't happen, but it's conceivable that the city council will say, you know what, we really think you got to provide us with a better option. I, I hope that I, I, I can't, in, I can't envision that being a popular outcome. But it, there's nothing that says we couldn't go that way. Could they define better? I would hope. I would hope that they're. I hope. I would hope that they they're, they would narrow their guidance and that we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I also want to say that when we were doing the budget and talking about the water rates, and there was a very clear statement made that we wanted to grant a little relief in terms of escalating the water rates, so that because we knew that this Snoopy was becoming. So, it's 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 been out there, and oh, yeah. you know, I, I think it's a little bit of a technical issue, and I think that. You know, I, I hope that people see that there are good minds working on this, mm -hmm. are thoughtfully deliberating, and will come up with a recommendation. Well, and I did raise, yeah, and I did raise the point that you know the first of the public hearings on stormwater started back in the fall. That this is not new news that we've been, you know, and that the second one, the first one was an overview of the issue, and Terry did a great job, and the mm -hmm. second one was a discussion specifically about fees. You know, so I mean. <laughs> you know, so. but you know, it's this. It's we're not. This is not a unique issue where people's attention is drawn to it more closely when you get to the fire. I haven't asked the guys, for instance, at at uh, the transfer station what Saturday last Saturday was like, but I suspect they took a lot of heat. I think that's an agenda item coming up. Is it informational? Oh, okay. So, sorry. Anything more to say on the stormwater and flood uh, And we meet again. We meet again tomorrow. Okay. We meet here, by the way. Right. Okay. Did you miss room? Did you miss room? <laughs> and that room. It'll be fun. I suppose. Okay. Solid waste planning update. Do you have thoughts on that? I just was uh, interested in hearing a report on how things have gone with the, the landfill program. Yeah. I didn't ask on Saturday. I went to just hold the guy, hold the people at the outside. I don't really have a formal report. Um, Dave Valletta indicated that things were pretty smooth on Saturday, that there were a handful of people at Glendale, I think, that were, uh, uh, had to be uh, informed of the changes, but um, I think things were pretty well here. 
I was here on Saturday, and uh, it kind of seemed like it always seemed, mm -hmm. although it was after 3, so it was there were definitely more people here than typically would be after 3, in my experience. But it's always it's a changing window, you never know. But it was, it was easy enough to get rid of my trash and recycling. I mean, it didn't seem to be difficult at all. I'll just mention from Reuse Subcommittee this morning that there's a uh, an event last weekend, which was a trunk sale, and that was so we're happy about that. And um, there's one this weekend on um, medical take back, and um, Karen thought it might be the last national medical take back. And a lot of the uh, there's several places in the community that are taking back um, drugs. For instance, at our police station, and I think there's one at the site in Northampton that's doing that. And then um, uh, on um, on May 18th, there's household hazardous waste. Really? And oh wait, I forgot. 511. There's the um, Save Our the SOS plant sale, and there's going to be a combined um, reuse of um, pot. Pick up and garden <coughs> exchange. So anybody that are gardeners and have to bring in rakes you're not using anymore, and pick up some shovels. Is that the annual smoke book? Can we yeah. get rid of? Yeah. Are we just the medical, all the pot? medical pot? Only. <laughs> well, you know they're Nobody round. Knows. They're round. So we'll see if that works. Like about this, maybe something like yeah. that. Oh. Yeah, those pots there. Are. Can we drop them off or pick them up? Both. Oh. Both. Wow, Both. and that's on and the eleventh. And we can exchange them. That's on the eleventh. That's on the 11th. Do yes. I need an appointment? No. <laughs> not you. Anyone else. <laughs> but not you. Yeah. And then on um, 6th, on June 22nd, bulky rigid plastics. Again, take it or leave it, textile and hot, and household goods and bicycles. I like bulky rigid plastics. Yeah. I always get my five gallon gallon the bulky pumps. rigid plastics? On the June 22nd. These are all at Smith Folk. But the bulky rigids are difficult to manage and will be, you can dispose of those at the regular, at the Glendale when we're open for difficult to manage. Bulk. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Chris, you just have to crawl into yeah, the dumpster the to get yours. Yeah, but the good thing about this is that there's a potential for reuse. I'm not yes. first. No, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But some of the things that people bring for reuse aren't really very reusable. I know. <laughs> okay. So that's for use. Uh, Chris, do you have anything more? I do actually have two. One of which I'm going to put on the agenda item uh, as an agenda item for next go round because I really wanted Ned to be here. It has to do with um, a private citizen um, cutting down uh, trees, public public shade trees on, on his property after he was specifically informed that it was inappropriate to do so. It's the first time in the short term that the tree committees had, had to deal with this, so it's unclear what our our avenues of um, response are, but um, I think we feel that it's something that can't can't go un unresponded to. So, uh, I, I, because Ned's not here, because I would like to be better prepared uh, <coughs> and figure out what my ask is with regard to the Board of Public Works, I'm, uh, I'm going to hold off until next go. Okay. But I will say that Friday is Arbor Day, and in the spirit of the holiday, uh, the Tree Committee will be giving out uh, free saplings um, Friday and Saturday from 9 till 1, and the trees this year are uh, White Oak, uh, Red Bud, and Rosa Sharon, and they're available until they run out. Excellent. Where are they going to be distributed? Right here. So if you're a member of the Board of Public Works, you come early, is that what you think? I think everybody come early and, you know, right limit right. one per and until they run out. Can I just say that I got one of those saplings a few years ago, and it is just wonderful. It's just growing. It's like, it's amazing. So I love every year to look at it, because when I got it originally, it was a little tiny little yeah. thing, and it's really growing. So. What did you get? Um, it's 
gosh, she was a Japanese something. I can't remember the name. <laughs> I always forget, but it's lovely. And it's just, I just have to say, it's a wonderful thing that you guys do. So I just think that it's it's great. Because every time I look at it, I remember when I got it. And, and it was uh, Deb. Deb, I can't remember her last oh, name. Oh, yeah, Deb. Yeah, and she gave it to me. And I just remember it was a little tiny yeah. thing. And now it's yeah. growing in my yard. And it she makes me happy. No, I mean, she was actually, <laughs> yeah, well, she, was, she was hijacked to do some Deb Jacobs, work. Yeah, yeah, that's I, Deb I, Jacobs, yeah. I just saw her the yeah. other day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the, ro the red bud and the Rosa Sharon are classified as smalls, and the oak is a large. Uh, the city apparently has a lot of our email addresses because I keep getting emails from the city once in a while. So there must be a database with all that. And these things that you're talking about here are almost like public information things for the common good. And it almost seems like those things ought to be popped up on people's emails as they happen. You know, because if you go searching for them, that's one thing. But if it shows up and oh, it's this weekend, I can go do that. It might be the, the planning department has a, uh, you, you can sign up to get emails from them. And I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's, I mean, I've gotten things in the past that they were just city information things. I can, I can look at that. You know, this, this, particular, this particular board doesn't seem very easy to get information out of. But if you've got a hazardous waste pickup, that affects, you know, lots of people. And to go digging for it in the Gazette, not everybody gets the Gazette anymore. Wouldn't it be nice to sort of get a robo email saying, hey, this is coming? Yeah, you know, the idea that what the robo email and phone calls are related to weather, but do they go beyond that? And should they? Yes. I mean, it's the city. You're yeah. a parent of a school child. Yes. Oh, yes. I, uh, this came up in another context, and uh, <laughs> if, if we were going to vote, I would, I would limit it to public safety stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise they just stop listening to them. Exactly. I mean, we see the school department calls us at least once a week to tell us that it's about T-shirts or <gasps> play tonight oh, or. Yeah. And so we stop answering. We yeah. just hang up when we see the city. Yeah. So when they say there's no school day. today, you don't even pay attention. <laughs> That's why you don't. Well, the kid anyway. We actually take our phones off them before they call us because otherwise it wakes up the kids. Gary. Oh. I was going to bring a book tonight to show the board, and I forgot to bring it, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway, because I have the floor. The Florence Civic and Business Association, um, Jason Clark, who's the current president of that, worked with Craig Del Pena on an Images of America book about Florence. And there's some really amazing photographs of Florence in this book. I picked up a copy the other day of the Florence Hardware. So it's available if you're curious about things like this. The photos are amazing. Uh, it's just just an incredible number of pictures, um, and I've seen a lot of them that are in the Florence Civic and Business Association um, collection. Mm -hmm. I've seen many of those, but it's just amazing the ones that are in there. There's actually uh, a picture of the barns when the electric trolleys used to come in, and you can see it. It's from that direction looking up, and you you can see it's amazing. I mean, you, you recognize the outline of the building and everything. Wow. But uh, it's a lot of fun anyway if you're interested in sort of old photographs and what's the, the history name of the book? Images of Images America. Images of America, Florence. So all the retail. Is, is this published by Arcadia? It is. Oh, well, I'm very familiar with. Um, I have a lot of their books. They're yeah, great. it's a series, right? So, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I think by Craig. Craig uh, was the author of the one on Holyoke, which was done 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, it's great. I think um, many of the merchants in Public Florence have it. Mm -hmm. If you're kind of floating around up there, I know Todd has it at the hardware store because that's where I picked one up the other day. But uh, I'm sure they have it at the barber shop and everything. Yeah. So, but check it out. It's really, really fascinating. BJ, okay. MJ, I'm good. Okay. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Oops, sorry. Aye. 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 <laughs> there's a there's one on Northampton too.